You know, we were supposed to do this a few days ago and we had to change it, but this turned into the best birthday present that I could have. <laughs> Happy birthday. One of my favorite rock stars on my birthday. So thank you for rescheduling. It's my pleasure. <laughs> um, I want to talk about Sleepwalker a lot because I like it, but do you mind if we go through your history a little bit? Not at all. Um, I'm sure everyone's trying to do that with you. Um, I know you're from St. Louis originally. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what your childhood was like and when you started to get into music? Sure. I had big brothers and sisters, um, and some of my earliest memories are, and a little brother, um, and there were always records around my house, um, floating around my house, um, music, you know, floating through my house. My dad loved Cole Porter and loved, uh, music, loved, loved classical music. And we had a stereo in our living room. Um, uh, my mom, like my mom liked Joni Mitchell and Billy Preston and various other, you know, artists of the Carly Simon and things like that in the seventies. And then my brother, big, big brother and sister whom I worship, they were in classic rock, um, Hendrix, um, let's see the stones the the who very much the who uh, uh zeppelin aerosmith um eric clapton uh well i guess it was cream um and the bird uh birds um the yard birds was his band um i anyway, i'm trying to remember like everything that was coming through my house um they love traffic and they loved the Beatles. And one of the first records that was given to me was um, Abbey Road by my big brother, Kenny. That's a good one. Yep. And Fleetwood Mac Rumors, one of my first records, um, Dream, Dreamboat Annie by Heart. And um, I was mesmerized by Anna, Anna Nancy Wilson. Just would stare at that album cover um, and listen to that song um, over and over. And um and to the album itself and um uh the mamas and the papas and the harmonies in that band were just incredible and i think one of my actually even prior to that was peter paul and mary my mother gave me wow. that my mother played that for me and i used to love those songs and um like lemon tree and um blown in the wind and whatever like those beautiful songs but i i remember hearing the beatles for the first time and just thinking oh my God, what, what is this? Like hearing come together was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. Um, and then golden years by Bowie on the radio. Um, and thinking this, this is just loving that song so much. And my mind was blown. And so somebody, I got David Bowie changes one for my birthday. And, um, those are some of my favorite early records. I have to let my dog out. Hold on a second. <laughs> My cat usually makes an appearance in, uh, when I record it in my office at home, so <laughs> he might show up. You started playing piano at an early age, didn't you? Yeah, I started playing piano when um, I think I was, well, I think as early as I can remember, I was playing piano. Um, I started taking lessons at seven, I think, but I was playing piano from as soon as I could. My next door neighbor... Sue Leonard, she was my best friend and she was a little older and she played, um, she taught me heart and soul and would play that with me. And I just recently taught my nieces heart and soul and they, they, it was so sweet. It was so meaningful to watch them plunk it out and they're twins. And now, now they know how to play it together, the top and the bottom. So when I go home to St. Louis, I get to see them perform it and hear it. It's so sweet. It was one of, it was great joy and learning the top part and playing it in duet, um, like it was so much fun. Um, so, and then when I was like, I was nine, my, this boy I had a crush on who was in my little group we were, we were in a, we were called them, we, we called ourselves gangs. My big brother had a gang. My big sister had a gang. There were all kinds of kids on the block, but they were like big Catholic families with 12 kids in them and seven kids in them. And we all kind of paired off into our age groups and right. misbehaved together. And our parents were never like, you know, watching. And, um, I remember one of this, this, boy had uh gave me the album bread baby i'm a want you <laughs> and um God, i love that album i loved it so much so I, i've always loved music and oh ringo Starr's solo album was amazing 
Um, and the musicals that came around, like at that time, like my mom and dad took my brother and sisters to see hair. And I was so mad I didn't get to go because there was a naked scene and I wasn't allowed. But they brought home the record for me and I played it down to the bare bones um, and Godspell, also one of my favorite records. Wow, you you were, had a lot of music around you when you were yeah, young. Yeah, you didn't expect that answer, but yeah. I, I, <laughs> and then I was in musicals um, from a young age and choirs, just as long as I can remember. And I played uh, music with my mom. My mom played guitar and taught me how to sing in harmony. And that became like a defining part of my life, obviously. You played in a couple of bands in St. Louis, but you played keyboards in those bands, right? I played in a band called, um, played in a band with my brother called um, The Prodigy. This was pre before Prodigy. I think I heard that somewhere in an interview. Yeah. And we, we did like uh, Go Go's covers. I played Our Lips Are Sealed and Vanity Six covers. Um, and then I was in a band where I play, I did play some keyboards. I, I mostly sang cause I had another keyboardist and, um, yeah, I, and that's what I played. And then I didn't start playing guitar until I was like 20 in college. Yeah, I was going to uh, jump ahead to that. Cause I know you went to Barnard college. How did you decide uh, to go to school there? That's a good school. Yeah, it's a great school. My, my stepmom went there and my stepsister went there, um, who I just, to consider my sister and I um she was old four years older so I went and visited I went I didn't want to go to college I want to stay in this band in St. Louis and my mother said we're going on a we're going on a college trip honey <laughs> and took me back east we went and visited um the seven sister schools mainly because I was my mom went to Sarah Lawrence my stepmother went to Barnard and um there's a history of that in my family. My, uh, it was, it, it intrigued, it intrigued me going to an all women's college. So, so you, we Wellesley, went, you mean like Wellesley and Smith were probably on that list too? Yeah. Wellesley Smith, um, Mount Holyoke, um, Barnard. Um, let's see. We also visited Wesleyan and, mm -hmm. uh, Princeton. Wow. My dad went and I, I, I visited New York city and, after all the other ones, like at Mount Holyoke, they, it was beautiful. I mean, it's a gorgeous campus an incredible school, but I remember them saying at 10 o'clock, we give the girls uh, milk and cookies every night. <laughs> and then I contrast that with this gorgeous dining hall and then contrast that with Barnard in the middle of Manhattan, well, upper Manhattan. And uh, this, like their dining hall was, the Columbia had a really nice dining hall but Barnard across the street, we got like, it looked like my, my cafeteria from, you know, grade school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it was, there were no frills. I mean, Barnard is a lovely place, but there were no frills, but it was New York. And my sister yeah. took me, my sister took me to, um, to the East village and then put me, you know, took me on the subway and I rode the train for the first time. And it smelled like piss and, um, we went up to her house, her apartment in Spanish Harlem. We stopped at the liquor store and got potato, like Lay's potato chips and vodka and orange juice, made screwdrivers and stay, stayed up till the wee hours. And I thought I'm coming here. This is where I want to be. <laughs> it's New York city. And, uh, that was that. I heard, I read or heard in an interview that you were a fan of Suzanne Vega, who also went there. I bring this up because I got to meet and work with Suzanne a little when I worked at AM Records. She is cool, <laughs> very cool. Uh, you really liked her, apparently, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, I came across her music at that time. I think sophomore year in college, um, they stuck me and a bunch of the students off campus at this building called the Lucerne on 79th and Amsterdam. And I was in an air shaft. Um, and there were a lot of people with fixed housing, fixed rents from so there was like a real like elderly set and then a bunch of young barnard sprites like coming into that building in flux um and it was a, it was a big contrast the the tenants in the building um like there was a couple that would just throw plates up and down the hall and yell at each other while we were in study hall you know <laughs> it was just nuts there was a guy next to us who would just moan at night and it was you know there was nothing we could do to help him it was very weird <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, I, I was, that was a kind of, it was a strange year cause I was off campus and I was commuting in a school bus 
and our there was no we didn't have any light in our apartment like really green depressing carping and um really no sunlight because we were on it we were on an air shaft and the i remember the the radiator just clanging all the time um and we didn't have a kitchen so we'd wash our dishes like in the sink and the bathtub um my my stepmom who went to barnard was horrified when she came to visit she's like for the money we spent for you to go here i can't believe they have you here and but you know it was home <laughs> um and the point is that they were playing luca on the radio at the time mm -hmm. and i was listening and i can't remember when i got that record but um oh, this preceded luca yeah luca was on the record with cracking and i was in love with her music and then i discovered that she and i shared a well later i found out we we shared a, a thesis advisor uh, and she was my one of my favorite professors in college named Tamia Sell. Um, and Suzanne Vega had also been an English major. She may have had something to do with my choosing my major, although I was already on on track for that. But um, she really she really influenced me. I mean, um, I, I really identified with her songs, with her songwriting, with where I was in my life. And um, I thought she was incredible. I still do. And um and then Tom Steiner came out, which is, of course, where we all ate. Mm. And it is not looks nothing like it does in Seinfeld. It's a different in, interior, just so everybody knows. It's the same out. You can see the the, the sign outside, but that's not our Tom Steiner inside. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then I, the, there was a um, centennial celebration of Carnegie Hall and Suzanne Vega and Laurie Anderson, also a Barnard alum, played there. Oh, yeah. That nice. was really, really nice to go see. Really special. And I saw her play in St. Louis um, when after college, I think. Um, and I just have always adored her. Wow. Um, I also heard that you started playing guitar at in college. And I don't know if this is true or not, but was Chinese Rocks the first song that you learned how to play on guitar? I think I heard that in an yeah. interview at one point. Yeah, it was. my A woman who lived down the hall from me at that time in that apartment, she um, she became a good friend and I still just adore her. And I'm so grateful to her for just going, here, take my guitar. Here's, here's a chord book and some sheet music to the Love Boat theme song. <laughs> and um, I'm going to teach you how to play Chinese rocks. And that was it. And I was off to the races. I really just, yeah. Were you like a fan of the dolls and the Ramones at that time? Or did you or did she just turn you on to this track? Well, I mean, I loved the Ramones. Um, but I didn't know I, I wasn't like, I mean, I had I had the record with I listened to it in high school a lot with Beat on the Brat and um what record was that? Just called the Ramones, the Ramones. Yeah, I think it was their first record, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that record was incredible and i listened to that ad nauseum in high school so but i didn't know chinese rocks actually when she taught it to me that's a good one yeah. um you started writing poetry in, in college too so is that when you kind of tried to figure out how to put it all together with the guitar and the poetry or were they separate for you at that time you really done your homework i'm so impressed <laughs> um thank you for, for taking the time to know this about me I um I did yeah I it was it it was a confluence of of different things for sure I mean Suzanne Vega's music um read like like poetry and I started writing poetry I had begun writing it really when I was like ten years old and my I moved we moved houses um and oh you wrote poetry when you were a lot younger. Well, I did. I started writing poetry at a young age. I just would, cool. I found solace in just sitting alone with a notebook and starting to write poetry. Uh, actually, the first poem I wrote, um, I wrote in calligraphy in second grade, and it was called Sun, Wind, Rain. And uh, my mom had it framed on her wall for a long time. And it was, um, in the beginning, I was not alive. Then I went out into the world and found life. I felt the breeze of wind the warmness of sun, drops of rain. Now I am alive. Wow. I can't believe you remember that. I, it was on the wall. I asked her recently if she still had it. She said no. Wow. But, 
but yeah, I think in hindsight, like, especially now that I have a child, I, I think there's something pretty profound about that. Um, just that that came out of a, a second grader, um, because we're, when we're younger, we're able to, to remember what it was like before. And at least I believe that from having experienced, well, certainly at some point experiencing it myself, but watching, <laughs> watching it with my child and watching it with other people's children and reading a lot about it and watching a lot about it, just remembering the younger children, remembering what it was like before. Um, we don't have to go into all of that, but whether it's past lives or the time between lives, um, it's been described to me by my own child in different ways. So um, I just love that the idea that back then I had some kind of recollection of, of just the beginning, you know? Yeah. What the beginning was um, instead of my beginning was my first cry after I was born, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I did. I found solace at, it, in writing poetry after my parents divorced and we moved to a new house and I would sit out in the front stoop with my notebook. And I just remember it very vividly just starting to write poetry then, but I didn't really necessarily write through high school. Um, and then in college, I took a serious poetry writing class and I was told I wouldn't get anything more than a C by my submissions. Um, after having read my submissions, this visiting professor said, you won't just want you to know, you know, you won't get more than a C in this class if you, you're welcome to take it. And I was like, oh, really? Let's see about that. Now, won't we? <laughs> um, and I, I did not get a C. I did much more than that. But I was I was definitely inspired by the poem, but the poetry um, that I read in the class, uh, Audre Lord poetry, these very powerful, formidable feminist poets. And um, I, I love Adrian Rich and I had really been listening. I'm reading a lot of John Donne poems prior to that. Um, I'd like Ben um, Ben Johnson and John Donne, like light verse. And so I submitted stuff that was more along those lines. It wasn't modern poetry. It wasn't contemporary. But by the end of that class, I was writing contemporary poetry. And, um, and then it did feed into my songwriting for sure. I took another course uh, after graduation. And at that point I was already writing songs and um, and I was performing at like open mics, cafes and things around campus. And I was also in an acapella singing group. So um, we're, we, it was just really fun. I guess it was my version of a sorority. Oh, I didn't realize you were performing in New York. I thought that didn't happen until a little later. My, my mm -hmm. next question was going to be, did you go back to St. Louis or did you move straight to Chicago? I went to St. Louis and I had this boyfriend in, in college who up and down and, and long distance. And um, he and I went, I went back to St. Louis and it became clear that we weren't <clears throat> moving forward. We were like, we were like sweethearts since like sixth grade. I mean, we went back that long. Like he carved our initials in a tree and in sixth grade. And, um, and then eventually when we were 19, um, we re-met at a Fishbone concert in St. Louis and he was in a band of course. And we ended up uh, dating on and off for like all of college or three years of it. And when I went back to St. Louis, it was pretty clear that it wasn't gonna, it wasn't going forward. And I wanted to get out of there. And I had a friend who, another friend I'd known since sixth grade who lived in Israel. And he's like, come here. I just called him and he's like, just come here. And so one night I was at, I just bought my ticket I was at the Who concert one night with a bunch of friends. And the next morning, I was on a plane to Israel. What? Wow. Yeah, he picked me up in Tel Aviv, and we went to Jerusalem. He lived in the old city in the Jewish quarter. And I I remember just looking out over the city with him from a rooftop and listening to Muslims calling people to prayer. And um, on the, the horn, I forget the name of it right now. And it was just so peaceful and so vastly different. It was an entirely different world from being at this arena, watching the who to being in Israel on the rooftop in the old city. And um, I was there for six weeks. I traveled. I, 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 uh, I learned a ton about Judaism. Um, I considered like, I considered converting. I've really kind of, I found God there. 
And and then I, I was had this calling because I had seen a theater company in Chicago earlier that summer called The New Criminals. I'd seen them work out, like do a, a improvisational workout. And they were so incredible. And one of my, another childhood friend was in that theater company. It was uh, John Cusack's theater company. Oh, and nice. A lot of theater actors were in it. John's brother and um, Jeremy Piven, who we all have all yeah. come to. Um, Paul Edelstein, who's a formidable actor and has a great career now. A lot of people um, came out of there. Paul Quinn, Aiden Quinn's brother, and Tim Robbins' sister, Adele. Um, it was it was a really talented group of actors from Evanston, Illinois and around Chicago. And I saw them, it was like punk rock theater. It was so cool. They wore the white face makeup. It was all based in Commedia dell'arte. And I was so enthralled and like felt my heart racing. And I thought I could do that. I could do that. So when I was in Israel, I was both like lured to like, to stay there instinctively. I felt like I want to stay. I just want to stay here. And then I also had this pull, like really strong pull to go to move to Chicago and start just be in the arts, like whether it's be in that theater company or play music full time, start a band. It was calling me. And I had this vision of like driving a Jeep and blasting Zeppelin out of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a convertible Jeep. I never got the Jeep. <laughs> Um, I did blast Zeppelin quite a bit. Still do. I believe that. <laughs> and I ended up uh, leaving Israel and moving back to uh, St. Louis. I literally, uh, uh, one of those kids in those big Catholic families, uh, she was grown up and had an apartment with a room in it. And she said I could live in it. And so I packed up some, um, like just trash bags full of clothes and got in my car. My little Mazda was not a Jeep and not very romantic. And I drove in the night. Listen, I remember I listened to Pink Floyd, Animals, and um, what's the other one? Pigs on a Wing. Um, Dogs, animals. pigs, sheep. Yeah, well, it's one with here on it, that album. Um, all uh, driving up, um, driving up to Chicago, and I moved moved to Chicago, and everything changed. The story, the story is that you were, you had a party, I guess, at your house and you're, you decide to put your own cassette of music on. If I'm wrong, correct me. And Lily Taylor, I love her. Uh, you mentioned Cusack. I know her and Cusack work together a lot. Those Chicago people are all pretty tight in the, in the, in that, that area, the film area. And the, the, is this true that she heard it and she said, I have this friend named Nina. And then she told Nina about you and that's how you guys met. Is that the real story? Yeah, very much so. Lily actually, um, so I was dating Billy Cusack, who was John's brother. You were? Wow. Yeah, cool. Bill. And, and he's the only other, only other person I ever lived with other than my husband. Because after the, after that ended, I thought I'm not, I'm not ever going to do this again until I, until I know it's the right one. <laughs> And, um, but we were very close and lived together for a couple of years and we were having a new year's Eve party. And he said, it's just a small get together. And he said, uh, Lily's in town and I'd love for you to meet her. You have to meet Lily. And, um, Billy is the one who like sat me down and said, so I was writing songs and I was in this theater company, new crime at that point. And he, uh, I was really struggling with like, well, what do I do? What do I, what do I make my business? Like I have to choose. It really felt like that because I had a four track and I was recording my songs. And he said, I think he said, you could, you're a really good actor. You can do whatever you want, but um, I see you making records. I see, mm -hmm. I see you writing poetry, making records. I feel like that is, that's that. And when he said that, it was like, and he said CDs because that's what, what was happening at the time. But as he said that, and it was, it really resonated with me. And that moment changed everything. And I really, I really have Billy to thank for that juncture in my life, that critical juncture, because if he believed in me that much, um, 
I, I that and that really propelled me, helped me believe in myself, I should say. And it's not just because he was someone, uh, uh, you know, the man in my life or whatever. It was because, in a way, it's because his family had already succeeded in a way that was only imaginary to me, sort of, you know, John and Joan were already like in Hollywood. I, I used love to Joan. <laughs> yeah. Joan's incredible. I used to leave my house in high school and say, bye mom, I'm off to Hollywood. <laughs> and I don't, I didn't know what Hollywood was or where it was really. I just knew it was LA on the West coast somewhere, but I was in the middle of the U S and St. Louis and it seemed like another world. And it was the joke because I was always acting and I was in theater and musicals and but that was always what I said it was my sign off right and um and so anyway when when Billy said that I see you making CDs I see you making writing poetry and and that that's really what I feel like who you well whatever that's who he saw me as and um soon after we, uh, I was recording with my brother uh, my younger brother Eric was recording at uh working at a studio in St. Louis and um, he was recording his own music, but he facilitated this, this demo for me. And I was playing it when we had this party and Billy had wanted to invite Lily Taylor. And, uh, I was a little threatened cause they had dated. And I said, are you sure? I don't know if I want to meet your ex-girlfriend. And he said, no, 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 you must meet her. It's not like that. She's so cool. Um, so I believed him and I said, okay, okay. And she was of course, incredible and awesome. And, I, at one point I, yeah, I popped in the cassette and she heard it and I wasn't like having, everyone wasn't sitting down and intently listening to it. It was just on in the background, background I think, music. Yeah. Yeah. And I think she asked Billy who it was or something. And she came up to me and said, is this you? And I said, yeah. And she said, you have to meet my friend, Nina. She said it with such insistence. And um, I said, okay. She said, she, she just graduated college. She's looking for people to play with. She's an incredible voice. And she, you guys have to meet. And it was basically like Lily set us up as we've said a million times on a blind date and left town and left us to our own devices. And so well, the first time I met Nina, it was like me, and my guitar knocking at her apartment door. And I played her some songs and she played me some of hers. I liked her instantly. She reminded me of my family and I felt like I already knew her. And, um, and I, I, we sang together and I thought, okay, this is it. This is what I do now. And I know you tried to get, you tried a few other people out before Jim and Steve came into the picture, but it seemed like once they got on board with you guys, things started happening really quickly after that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Steve, um, Steve made just, if you're ever trying to start a band, children, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Just play with the person you really like to be around and who just makes sense. You just people, you just know. It's like you hear someone playing along with your songs, and Steve just fit in and elevated our songs in a way that we didn't know was possible. And that was that. It was like a done deal. I guess it was just like when I met Nina and played with Nina, um, sang together. I thought, done deal. This is this is right. This feels right. And then uh, same with Steve. It was just like, oh, he's right. He's perfect. And it, he's perfect because it's hard to put your finger on, but because he just instinctively knows what to play and he's sensitive to the music and he's cool as fuck. And he's a really nice person. And it, we all fit together. And then we were auditioning drummers and, um, nice people, you know, um, we weren't feeling like we had had that experience with anybody yet. And um, Jim was Jim Zena's brother, of course. And he uh, was, he's, you know, more of a, more of a bass player, guitar player, pianist, singer, songwriter, everything, but drummer, <laughs> but he did play some drums and he said, I'll, I don't know, you, you know, if, if you guys want, I'll just come in and hit with you just to give you an idea of some other, another feel we're like sure why not it wasn't like we were auditioning jim he was just coming in so we played with him and i had that feeling of like done deal this is it and i was so happy it was so 
clear. It was so simple. It was like right in front of us and he was in the family. And so I, I said, we, Jim, will you get a kit and join the band? And he's <laughs> like, yeah. And that was that. It was just like uh, amazing. And you and guys then, didn't, you, you guys didn't really play very many shows before Minty Fresh uh, got involved with the band, did you? No, um, three to be exact. Before three? We, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think Jim was at our first show, as was Brad Wood, who recorded American Thighs. And um, they were friendly and had some kind of deal where Brad was recording Jim's Seven Inches for Minty Fresh, which was a brand new label at that point. Um, he tried to sign Zoo, uh, Liz, Liz Fair to Zoo Records and they passed. So he left <laughs> Zoo. <laughs> And then Matador signed Liz, um, but he was done. He's like, I, I know, I know what's good. I don't need a label to, I don't want to speak for Jim, but that was his, his path. Um, but when we met, um, he was just eager to get us in the studio. And so he asked Brad to record, record us. And instead of doing a bunch of different seven inches to just put it all into this one album, and um, I don't know if Brad knew what he was getting into because we were not we were not easy to record. We weren't like some bands can just go in and knock it out in a couple of weeks. We had two weeks scheduled and I and it did it took much longer than that. So we started touring intermittently between like stretches in the studio because they were booked. They they had other bands coming in. And so they fit us in where they could and we finished the record piecemeal. And so by the time when Seether suddenly came out. We put we, we we chose to put it out, but we didn't know it was going to hit the way it did. Um, we we didn't even have a finished record to release, so we you know silly now to think about it, but we were like asking radio to hold off on playing it because we uh we weren't we weren't ready. We didn't have a full, we didn't have a product. <laughs> I, I remember that time well because I was at A and M Records, and I remember you guys kind of came out of nowhere. I know it's a lot of people says that happened, but did it feel like you sort of got shoved into the public eye really quickly? I know that you and Nina had been working on songs for a few years before that, but the success kind of came really quickly, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It it came out of nowhere. We were not expecting that at all. And we were, you know, of course we were over the moon. We were didn't even know what was happening to us. And it was like a whirlwind. Um, because, you know, I was essentially, we were managing the band, obviously, and if not more so me, because we we're both fielding all the calls and it was getting, a, it was a lot. Like I similar, I feel this way a little right now, honestly, because I'm self-managing, although I have a co-manager now um, who's taking so much off of my plate and helping me, in, you know, immeasurably. But um, I've been self-managing Sleepwalker and this whole project. project and um, at the, I remember it, it is it is hearkening back to what it felt like in the beginning of Veruca Assault to um, come home and literally have, at the time it was like, it, now it's like 17 or to 20 emails waiting for me, right? Or texts or you know, at the time it was voicemails and I had an answering machine and it would just blink. I remember the number 17 blinking at me when I came home one day, it was like booking agents, managers, lawyers, um, you know, clubs, uh, press. It was everyone who wanted to talk to us right at that moment, you know, and be a part of this. And um, we, we felt like, okay, this, this has gotten bigger than than us and we we can't really manage this on our own um but that said turning getting managers was um it changed us and it, i don't know that it was the smartest move in hindsight i don't know that we had a choice um maybe it was the management we chose but um we really needed somebody grounded to help us through what was happening to us and to be able to recognize it, identify it, and talk to us about what this was, be able to put a name on it and say, we've seen this before, we understand what's happening to you, and let us let us give you like a tutorial, like, let's lay the groundwork so you guys know what's going on. And to see like, 
to to protect us from ourselves really from like the inner workings of the band to be able to say like this is going to get hard on you guys i think the best advice we got was not from our management what was from vicky peterson from the bengals when we were in new orleans and she we were driving around with her and a friend in his really cool car and uh she we went to a couple of bars with them i think she she came to our show and of course we really admired her had lo- loved the bangles and um she said do not let them like pit you against each other mm. because the industry will try to do that and it wasn't just the industry it's 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 hum- it's like it's society i mean it's really just systemic uh gender bias um sexism uh not wanting women to succeed there's this you know it's all ingrained in our culture and we were it's the messaging that we received like we couldn't have just one lead we couldn't have we two lead singers it had to be one and one of us had to be better than the other and you know everyone chose a favorite and i mean that goes for like i mean men too like if you want to use the beatles for example like there's People love John, people love Paul, people love to choose, people love George, people love to choose one they like the best. So that's yeah. natural and it's fun for fans, right? But like it, we needed someone to really kind of like hold our hands through what was happening because we were absolutely um, overtaken by by sudden fame. I um I loved Blow It Out Your Ass. I remember buying that and thinking, uh, you know, uh, Chicago band, Chicago producer Steve Albini and Europe and shimmer and the whole thing was so great because I didn't know what direction you guys were going in. And then you come out with this real heavy thing. And I was like, this is fantastic. I remember we had this, band. this is a funny story, but I got to tell you this. I remember we had this band fig dish. They were a Polydor band, but they were marketed through A&M records. And I met the guys in the band and they had just done some dates with you guys. And there were a bunch of people standing around. And I'll admit it, I had a crush on Louise at the time, like a million other boys and girls. And they, and I'm like, they're everyone's, how's the tour going? How was it? And I'm like, how was Louise? Everyone looked at me like, you idiot. <laughs> Which I can <laughs> laugh about now, but at the time, was, the band's like, that's what you want to know about our tour, how Louise was? Well, first of all, it's that's I'm flattered. Um, and secondly, um, flat out that you know it was me and not Nina. I'm just kidding. Um, but secondly, the ir- irony in that is that the lead singer, one of the lead singers in that band, was dating Nina. I don't know if you knew that part. So that uh, probably added a layer of <laughs> complication to their response. I didn't care. I was, you know, alternative marketing guy at a record label, you know, and they were like, you know, very low on our radar, unfortunately. And I didn't think I, it was funny. It was a funny thing, but I do remember that. Cause you guys like, cause when I heard that EP, I was like, wow. Then you recorded eight arms to hold you with Bob rock. And I was like, wait a second. They just went from Albini to Bob rock. Can you just tell me how the hell that happened? Yeah. Um, First of all, Albini was, can I curse on your podcast? Yeah, of course. Oh, good. I don't know. Albini was just like a big fuck you to the like indier than thou community in Chicago that we felt snubbed by. And it was originally going to be called blow it out your indie ass. It's Ruruk Assault. And <clears throat> we changed it. It was too long of a name, you know, it couldn't be bothered. <laughs> but, um, so we, and we, we, we had wanted to record, uh, America thighs with Albini, um, but we also did with Brad and we made the decision. The decision was kind of, well, we made the decision ourselves, but we still wanted to record with Steve and we had no regrets about Brad, of course. Um, so it was perfect opportunity to get off the road and just record an EP with Steve. Um, and beyond that, um, um, we were at, we were on tour with live and PJ Harvey Wow. Sheds in 1995. And so I remember like we were doing the West Coast and um, I just remember every night, every day we'd be sitting at catering and listening to the sound man for live 
ring out the system, the, the sound system with Enter Sandman. Like that's the song he would play every day to, to hear if everything is sounding right. And uh, the and so every day we heard Enter Sandman. And one day we were talking about who we were going to record the record with. And we had had a meeting with Brendan O'Brien, who's amazing. Yeah. Me. But he said he works really fast. He said, I don't work longer than seven weeks. He's like, after seven weeks, I'm done. And that may seem like a long time to make a record to certain people, but to us, it wasn't. We really wanted to dig in. We wanted to have a few months. And um, I mean, like minimum three months to make our record. We wanted to really spend time on it. And um, so we thought, you know, unfortunately that wasn't a match only because of the his timing limit. Um, and so we we had the same management as Metallica also at the time. And they were like, they were kind of, they'd kind of been known to be like at the time sort of dinosaurs in the industry because they managed like Def Leppard and Metallica and these bands that were like, you know, really cool, but like metal, metal bands and metal wasn't the coolest thing at the moment, you know? Right. <laughs> and they had seemed to have had their day and we met with them and Nina and I just kept making these decisions in the band that just seemed like the most punk rock thing to do, the most surprising thing to do. Um, and with, with the EP with Albini, we just wanted to keep recording. Um, I probably made that happen because I was just like always wanting us to go forward. And Nina calls me the quarterback. Like I was always, and still am when, you know, in the recent past, like always throwing the ball down the field, always making the next play um and setting set, sending us downfield towards the towards the goal um the field goal but um at any rate um goal post is what i'm looking for anyway so uh we're sitting around the catering and listening to enter sandman every day and we had the same management as metallica we knew bob rock because of metallica and our management and uh there we were listening to this and somebody said like maybe me maybe nina maybe jim like what sounds better than this <laughs> and we wanted to make a monster rock record like we we really we wanted to go the distance and in some ways american thighs had sounded really indie to us and we were ready to sound big we wanted to sound really big um and in hindsight like butch vig would have been a good you know call but mm -hmm. he I think at that point it started garbage and was really in, involved in, in, in like in very much taken up with that. Um, but I don't even remember if that came up. We had had lunch with him because we talked about re-recording American Thighs at one point. I won't get into all that. But um, but yeah, we just thought, what sounds better than Enter Sandman? What sounds better than the Black Album? Nothing. So let's let's work with Bob. And we just made a decision right then and there. And we're also, again, we're just like, fuck all y'all. We are going to record this monster <laughs> rock record with Bob Rock. So, you know, like just, and it's going to be incredible. 